Urban Gateways has been engaging young people in arts experiences to inspire creativity and impact social change since 1961. The following program celebrates the 60th anniversary of Urban Gateways. The Art and Speaker series highlights the intersection between the arts and thought-provoking topics. Each event will feature compelling artists, some that are part of the Urban Gateways network and some from outside the reach of the organization. We invite you to sit back and take in some powerful perspectives that we hope will leave you feeling inspired. The Art and Speaker series is brought to you by our sponsors, Salmon's Financial Group, Werner Co., and Robbins, Solomon, and Pat Limited, Attorneys at Law. Today we highlight the wonderful world of storytelling. What is storytelling? Some might define it as the act of telling, showing, or writing a story, but for these artists, it means so much more. Let's meet William Bill Eller. My name is William Eller. I'm a visual artist for Urban Gateways, or should I say a retired visual artist. I retired last December 2019. And I originally worked with Art Resources and Teaching, and I started in January of 1980. Let's keep it going with Mo G. Hey, it's Mo G. I am a natural hair artist, as well as a natural hair instructor. And finally, we have Zara Glenda Baker. Hi, I'm Zara Baker, and I'm a singer and a storyteller. While each artist is a storyteller in their own right, they all have very different artistic disciplines and backgrounds. For instance, Bill focuses on visual arts. When I was a child, I spent hours and hours and hours drawing continuously. I can tell you the earliest artwork that I did was I used to draw little soldiers shooting at each other, making up stories of what was going on with it for hours on end. And I remember I did that when I was probably six, seven years old. And then when I got into high school, I was able to take high school art classes. And then when I went to, as a freshman in a junior college, I was becoming an art major. But all this time, what was going on since I was the age of 10, I actually was also doing music all the time. And at the age of 14, I actually was professionally getting paid money to be a musician and played in bands all the way through high school. And I went on the road and got off the road at the age of 19 because I said, this isn't the life for me. I should be doing what I want to do, which is being a visual artist. And so I've become a visual artist ever since. Another Illinois native, Mo G, is known for a different kind of visual art. I am from the Chicago suburbs. It was just me and my mom, she was a single parent. And I always had a passion for doing hair. I remember every Christmas I would always ask for like dolls centered around doing hair. My mom was just telling me the other day how she taught me how to corn roll when I was about three years old. I was like, Mom, how do you do that? Do you do it this way? So she showed me how to do it. And that same night, I went and did all my dolls hair and corn rolls. And I displayed them all on the kitchen table so that she could see my work. I feel like that was my first time when I really, that was like my first hair show. And eventually I started doing my own hair. When my mom would like go to sleep at night, I would like stay up late, close my door. And the first time she woke up and she saw my hair and I was like, okay, if she likes it, if I can keep my hair like this, then it's gonna be good. If not, then you know. 
And I would have grades just, you know, to have a protective style to um, go swimming in and stuff like that. I also used to work at the pool. So from there, one of the mothers, she asked my mom if she could pay me to do her daughter's hair. And my mom was like, yeah, let me ask her. And that's actually how I got started and how I got clients. It actually chose me. I never really chose to be a hair artist. It just kind of happened based on other people asking me. And Louisiana native Zara has used her voice to tell stories for as long as she can remember. So I was born in Colfax, Louisiana, and I am the last of seven children and the only one that was not born on the plantation. I learned from my grandmother the power to create all of the things that not only were functional for us, like the clothes that we wore, or the quilts that we needed to keep us warm, but they were also beautiful. Unfortunately, our family was hit with a lot of trauma by the time that I was four and actually was adopted by my uncle and aunt. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have my six brothers and sisters looking out for me. I didn't have my grandmother holding me or singing to me and everything felt strange and I felt isolated. But when my aunt took me to the Baptist church right down the street, all of a sudden when the choir started singing, all of the love from my grandmother and all of those mem memories rushed back to me and I felt comforted. And when the church choir started singing, this little light of mine, at five years old, I started wailing and singing out so loud, I was louder than the choir. And th by the next week, I became the youngest member of the adult choir. Having unique upbringings, experiences, and interactions is reflected in each of these artists' work. Their openness to curiosity and creativity has fueled their artistry. Natural hair is one of the most unique mediums in the world. There's not very many things that defy gravity. We can count the things that defy gravity. We have rocket ships, airplanes, birds, all types of things. Then you have natural hair. Natural hair defies gravity. It has a mind of its very own. So when it comes to working with natural hair, it is very much an art form because you have to figure out the best way to manipulate the substance that has a mind of its own. And you want to do it in a way that's protective of it. There is no, not a single person that I've come across that has the same type of hair texture. Whether it's parents, sisters, parents and their kids, nobody has the same hair texture. So you constantly have to learn how to work with this medium that's like ever changing. And the reason why protective styles are so important because it takes a long time to maintain natural hair. Even if you want to have an afro, you have to detangle it. You have to make sure it's moisturized. If you have braids, you have to make sure they're not too tight. You might not want them to be too long because you don't want them to get in your way. So you have to figure out a style that works best for you and your lifestyle. If you're very active, you may want some short braids or braids that are long enough to put in a bun or a ponytail. So with my creative vision, when I have different clients and people have different lifestyles and different obligations, I have to sit and analyze them and try to figure out the best hairstyles that I could give them that works well for their lifestyle. I was introduced to storytelling in my childhood. I, the 
the stories that were shared from my family, my uncles and aunts gathering together. This is in my new family that I was adopted into. And I learned their family history by them sitting on together on the porch every Friday night after the fi Friday fish fry, sharing memories. The children that were my age, we were probably preteen. We were so fascinated with the stories that we decided that we wanted to have a program in uh, during our family reunion so that the elders could share their stories because it was a migration story. It was a story of how one aunt moved from Tennessee to Lafayette and she got married and she bought a house. And then she wrote back and told her other siblings and then her brother came and he came and he got a job and bought a house. And then he welcomed another brother and another sister until finally he had a house big enough for his mother to come. Those were the first stories that I heard. They connected me to not only the history, but the generosity and the compassion that was inside of those stories. Then eventually I was exposed to professional storytelling once I moved to Chicago and got a chance to spend the day with one of the most famous storytellers at that time, who was Jackie Torrance. And she was someone who had taken all of her memories and all the stories that she had been given and just basically brought me back to sitting on the porch with someone telling those stories, but with the meaning behind them of how we could become a better person. Staying curious is one of the things I tell my students the first day that I'm in their classroom. I identify myself as a visual artist. I can do storytelling but I can also make art in other ways, but some people would say all visual arts is a story too. But I don't think of myself as a storyteller per se, but many, many of my friends do. I always say that I am a singer first. If, uh, oftentimes, like in situations like this, if someone asked me to speak, I would rather sing it. Wind the bobbin up, wind the bobbin up, pull, pull, clap, clap, clap. Wind it back again, wind it back again, pull, pull, clap, clap, clap. Point to the ceiling, point to the floor. Point to the windows, point to the door, and put your hands together, one, two, three, then make something that you need. My story is in my song. But I'm also discovering that I do have stories that I want to tell. and that, yes, I am a storyteller. None of the family were what you would call a storytelling family that way, other than, you know, the personal little story within the, the household. Since I was 10, I started performing, and then as I kept going, I was performing more and more, and I learned so much as a musician and how the leader of the band interact with the audience and I learned oh this is how you move things along and I just took that into what I did as my practice as a visual artist in the classroom and images would be built on top of each other so there was like a little story going on that may or may not really be the important part of the artwork that we were looking at. 
So I think that storytelling itself is an exchange of memories. I would definitely consider myself a storyteller. I am a person that has a long-winded way of telling everything because I'm so detail-oriented. So I like to tell the details of every single story I tell. So this represents my crown. I like to mimic a crown and like also kind of like a sun. So I want it to look like sunshine. And then bees to me are always fun. It just gives my locks a little more flow. I actually like the noise it makes. Um, I love music and sound, so that's why I had to get the bees. Bill, Moji, and Zara have each accomplished incredible success within their careers as storytellers. So, when it came to doing hair and I saw how it defied gravity, it made me think about huh, how many different ways can I make a crown? How many different crowns have we seen? There are so many types of crowns, just like there's so many types of hair. So that inspired me to go and to try to figure out different hairstyles that I could do that mimics different crowns so that people feel royal, so that people feel beautiful in their best. I know when a lot of people get their hair done, they feel better than they ever felt before. Like they instantly have a good day, they have a good week, they have a good time because their confidence is so high because they have their hair done and they look beautiful and they've been crowned. I think crowns are an art form, so when I take hair and try to mimic crowns, to me, that is my art, and hair is my medium. My work has been featured, and I've worked with Olive Oil, ORS, the company. I've worked with My African Pride Hair Company. I've been featured in Paper Magazine, Elle, Refinery29. I've worked with Jamila Woods so much, It just makes me really, really proud and really happy that hair is being so valued and it's becoming a bigger thing than what it was previously. I was able to go take a week-long week intensive with a woman named Ise Barnwell, who is part of, used to be part of a group called Sweet Honey in the Rock. And that group was founded by Bernice Johnson Regan, who was one of the freedom singers from the civil, civil rights movement. So that learning the legacy of how, our, how important our music is and how it has been a tool for our survival We learned about some of the African songs and learned about songs that were sung during captivity and then learned songs that were sung when spirituals moved into gospel was related to my, people migrating from the south to the north to a quicker pace. At that same uh, festival, there was a woman named Gaya Degbalola who was teaching blues. So she uh, gave me some private uh, lessons on the women in blues. So I had a wider uh, perspective about uh, African American music. Bill and Zara are current and retired teaching artists with Urban Gateways, and between them, They've developed dozens of programs that guide young people in exploring their creativity. In designing my residency, I wanted the children to know where the songs came from, but I knew that a half an hour lecture was not going to be appealing to them. So 
So that's when I remembered that storytelling would be the way. And then, so my excitement about taking that in is that it's just a vehicle to help them access their own story and to figure out their way. I believe that everybody has their own gift. We know that everyone has their own story, but I also believe that we all have our own special gift. And those two things enhance each other, like what is your story and what's the best way that you want to express it. I used to work for an organization called Art Resources and Teaching. I was invited to come to a meeting that the, that the Manassian brothers uh, of Evanston had called for and they had known one of the board members. And we got up to the meeting and they started discussing that one of the brothers had met the children's illustrator, Tony DePaolo. And they were riding together on the airplane together from one place to another. And they started chatting back and forth about what each of them did. Arnim said, well, I, we're, we're in the carpet business. And he said, I just did my first book that was about carpets. As everybody knows, meetings went on in all directions. And after about an hour and a half, I looked at him and I said, you know, ART is a visual arts program. And I said, could it be possible? Could we actually have kids design carpets? And their minds exploded. So we went into three schools that year, that all over the different parts of the city. We did the program. The students designed ideas for their carpets, and then we had a contest. And so we got our program going. We had it done. They had the design. They chose two carpets from each school, and then they went off and had them made. Well, for one reason or the other, after we got the carpets back, the schools got the carpets, and I'm not exactly sure what happened next, but the whole program ended after a year. When I began working for Urban Gateways, somebody on Urban Gateways board was also must have been on the ART board, and they suggested we should bring back the old carpet program. So we, they came to me and they said, we'd like to do this. And I did it for six years. I had parents over the years get, as, as their child might have been younger, were going, we're so excited. They're gonna be in sixth grade this year. I had teachers come up to me and say, it's our favorite program that we see in the arts that's going on here. Because we had a big art show every year of it. And at, at their holiday show every December, we would give the school the, the carpets that were designed, and they would be given to the school, and we would announce the next year's winners. Now, you think, well, a year later, well, these carpets are handmade by Afghanistan women in Afghanistan. So the designs are sent to them, they start doing this on looms, and the carpets are four by six feet, and they're tying at 200 knots per square inch. It takes them just about nine and a half months to make one of these carpets. And I'll never forget a couple of years ago, when we unrolled the carpet for everybody to see, the young woman who had designed the carpet, her mouth dropped open and she goes, it's more beautiful than I could have imagined. These artists understand the value of giving back to young people and inspiring others. 
in 2019, I decided to go back to school to get my hair braider instructor's license. Because when I was in class or like just, you know, just being around different people, I would always teach all my classmates how to do different hairstyles. Or I would have moms that would always ask me, how can I do my daughter's hair like this? Or how can I do my son's hair? Or just different tips and things. I really have a passion for teaching. Um, I have a way of just like helping people learn how to do things different ways. I started doing hair prior to YouTube, prior to the internet. So I had to learn how to do hair literally on my own with no internet, with no help, um, no sister to help me. My mom didn't really do hair. So I think that allowed me to learn how to teach other people because I had to try so many methods just to figure out how to do different styles and different looks. So my experience working with youth is actually interesting because I, uh, I think when I first discovered singing and realized that that's what I wanted to do, I hadn't thought about it as teaching. It was actually my father who was like, um, who encouraged me to major in music education as opposed to music performance. And initially at that time, it was like, well, thanks for believing in me. And he, you know, he said, well, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into becoming a successful, whatever that means, performer. So it's always good to have something to fall back on. Not only did I not um, want to put 100% into what I was doing, I didn't want to have another career that felt like something I was falling back on. So um, I didn't know that I would enjoy teaching until one of the directors there overheard me in music in my music lesson and asked me what I thought about giving a, a class in gospel music. It's like I learned gospel music in relation to being part of a church community. So I wasn't sure what he was talking about. And then about three months later, he sent the children's director to me and said, okay, here's what's happening. We want to bring some third graders in for a performance and we want to know if you can demonstrate some African-American songs from the African-American experience. And I was like, oh, yeah. Inside of the performance, I did this little light of mine, which is one of my favorite songs, and we had two mics. And there was one child that grabbed that microphone and he wailed, he leaned back and wailed, ah, this little light of mine. And everything in my heart just opened up and I was like, I want that. I love to see when that light bulb goes off, when that excitement, the, the activation of art in our lives um, is, is present. I enjoy sharing and I like enjoy, I enjoy sharing what I know for to other people and I've been so lucky I had the most fun in any job you could have and they paid me for it too. If I was on a bus it would be whoever was sitting next to them and if they were the type who wanted to talk next thing we know we're telling stories to each other. And they can be lies. I don't care. It's a new story. I'm convinced, and I used to tell parents years and years ago when I worked in a school, that I believe that the first creative act children have was when they would tell a lie to their parents and they got away with it. Because they now were making up a story out of fiction and everybody believed it. Not too long ago, I taught at a middle school. I taught some girls how to braid hair and do different hairstyles on their own. And we put together this big giant tree and each one of the girls may, I've taught them how to do a tree braid. And so at the end of so many weeks of working with them, we all took all our trees braids and put them together to make one big giant tree.
and it was up in the hallways um, until school ended. And it was just so interesting when the girls would come and talk to me about how they felt or just getting the different reactions from other students. But they all ultimately felt really, really proud. 2020 took us all on the ride and proved to be a challenging year with the global COVID-19 pandemic. Businesses and organizations closed their doors. Families lost loved ones and unemployment rates were higher than ever. The artistic community suffered as well. I was just ending my maternity leave as soon as the shutdown happened. So I was excited to get back to doing hair, to seeing all my clients and friends and everything. And it stopped me from doing hair for, what, three months or so. And I just was so devastated. I felt like I was gonna forget how to do hair. I thought that everybody was gonna forget me. I thought everybody would like magically learn how to do their own hair and they wouldn't need me. And all I kept getting was like, people just started doing their hair and it just made me realize how much my work is, how much of a valuable hair artist I am. After that, I mean, as soon as I got back to it, it was like I never missed a beat. I saw how much being a hair artist was ingrained into me. My first thing back was a creative project and it went phenomenally. And I got so much great feedback and it just really helped me learn and understand my like value as an artist and how important and how many people I actually touched that I didn't even realize I touched. People trying to do their own hair was also very funny because I would get all these pictures and videos which kept my spirits up of people attempting to do their own hair. And so I started to like try to teach more and it showed me how good of a teacher I am. I didn't realize, I thought so, you know, I had an idea. I am a, um, a licensed natural hair instructor, and but I hadn't got the opportunity to teach yet. So throughout the pandemic, I began to make tutorials and it got me tapping more into my media side that I like was so nervous to touch before, but since I had time on my hands <laughs> due to the pandemic, it got me into like all these other creative routes of how and where I can go about teaching hair, doing hair, or helping other people learn how to do hair. I know how powerful the arts are, and I know for me that the arts are my access to healing, to self-expression, and that they are essential. So actually what I had to do was remember my grandmother and my ancestors and the, the obstacles that we have overcome and all of the stories and songs that I use to teach with are actually tools to help, that have helped us in the past and that are, are relevant now. I want to learn, There's, there are still songs that I haven't learned, there are still stories that I haven't learned. I started doing my own work of, of expanding my repertoire and figuring out ways to get a deeper understanding about how our ancestors made a way out of no way. Despite the obstacles each artist faced during the pandemic, they were able to look on the brighter side and reimagine their work. The thing that I actually have noticed more than anything is how much people have relied on the arts to get through this challenging time. That uh, we, we would not make it without not only seeing art, but having a way to express ourselves creatively. It's 
staying curious is one of the things I tell my students the first day that I'm in their classrooms. Walking around, was, well, as I was just walking around in here, I was taking photographs of things that I found was interesting that you'd want to remember or what eventually might end up in my own artwork. Every day I go out because of the coronavirus, I do do my stroll every day, and every day I find something amazing that I just find interesting to look at and want to remember, and quite often it ends up working in my new artwork that I've been making in the last few years. I pretty much work on art almost every single day. Of course, I did that pretty much before it started, but now it seems to help make the time a little bit easier to deal with. Right now, I've been, I've had the opportunity to do some really exciting projects, most of them, of course, online. I'm uh, working with my storytelling partner, Emily Lanchina. We just got to do a really exciting project with the Art Institute. One of the other pieces I got to work on was a piece called Safety Patrol, which is seven children waiting at a, a crosswalk. And that reminded me of my siblings. So I was able to make that relationship, my personal life with this piece, and I uh, adapted the song from The Circle Be Unbroken and wrote a verse for each one of them and had pictures with them. And that was really exciting to do because uh, they were, because it was virtual, they were all able to join in on Zoom and watch it and see uh, their lives be validated and, in uh, ways that they couldn't imagine. I'm currently working on a braid exhibition. It's going to be an experience at Congruent Space. I will be showcasing a lot of the head pieces that I've made over the years, as well as showing off all the photo shoots and pictures that I've done. I'm really excited about that because this is my first big project where I'm not necessarily doing people's hair, but I'm showing off my artistic braiding pieces. I'm working on a natural hair program. I will be starting this summer, hopefully, depending on COVID restrictions, um, the date is to be determined. And I am working on getting my own salon so that I can bring in other stylists and let them grow their businesses and pursue their entrepreneurial skills. Your gifts, your gifts come so natural to you that a lot of times we don't realize they're gifts. We don't understand that it's a gift, it's a talent, and it's something that's unique to us. And don't ever, ever underestimate your ideas and your opinions. Always value them and treat them as if they're diamonds. Anybody who wants to be a storyteller, you're already a storyteller. You already have stories. And you want to find the ones that you love, the ones that you feel represent the best in you. Those are the ones you can start there. Start by speaking it out loud. There's a power in storytelling. Whether stories are inspired by the people we meet on the train, our childhood experiences, or bonding with those around us, stories are valued. These collections of words, images, style, tone, and patterns help us educate, enlighten, express, and entertain. There are no limits to the imagination, and the story can forever change the person experiencing it. Join us over Zoom for a live talk back with the artists. Storyteller and artist Jillian Grislak will host this exclusive event. Until next time, thanks for watching.
The Art and Speaker series is brought to you by our sponsors, Salmon's Financial Group, Werner Co., and Robbins, Solomon, and Pat Limited, Attorneys at Law.